Okay, well, at the end of class last time, we, were, we looked at the MIPS um, computer organization. And uh, let's go back and look at the figure 12.40. Figure 12.40, and we saw how these data flowed through these paths. Um, and at the end of the class, the, the example that we did at the end was a store instruction where uh, the data to be stored we put on the A bus and then we clocked the uh, data cache CK. We clocked it in and, and we put the, ad we calculated the address, the AOU calculated the address and that got clocked in like that. Is this m figure, example 12.10, this MIPS store instruction. And there's just one more example that, that we'll go through briefly before we go on to pipelining. And that is this MIPS add instruction. Now you remember that um, arithmetic operations in a risk machine are always between what two memory locate, what two locations, and then put in a third location. Where, where do all, where do all arithmetic operations take place? Like in PEP nine, when you would add something, you would take something from memory and add it to the accumulator and put the result in the accumulator, but. Where do all arithmetic operations take, pla take place in a risk machine? Between, between two what? Registers. registers in the CPU and they go to a third register in the CPU. So here's an example of a MIPS add instruction. It uses register addressing with R type instructions. And there's three five bit fields, RD for destination, RS and RT for the source. And what it ha the way it works is register RD gets the content of register RS plus the content of register RT. And this is a very simple one because in order, f in order for the data flow to work for this, what do we put on the A bus and the B bus and the C bus? Here, here again, it's just one cycle. Check this out, one cycle. So the A bus, we put what? RS on the A bus. We put what? RT on the B bus. Sorry. Yeah, on the B bus. And then from the C bus, we want the, 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 the result to go into what? Into C. And then we do load, uh, load, load CK. Load C, CK. So that does, that does the add, that takes the, the, the data from the source register, the data from the other source register, adds them together, puts them into the third register, and clocks it into the register bank. And the other, and wh what about the, what, what's, what's, what about the other? PC mux gets zero, J mux gets one, why do we do that? What does that do simultaneously in this one cycle? The, the C equals RD and the load CK, that's what puts it into the third register. But what's with the PC mux gets zero, J mux gets one? What is that doing simultaneously? Exactly, that it's incrementing the program counter at the same time. So the whole instruction executes in one cycle. Is that slick? Yeah, very nice organization. We looked at, there are three, these are the three primary ways to increase performance. And we've looked at the first two and now we're gonna look at a third very common way to increase performance. What was the first technique for increasing the performance? Increasing the width of the buses, and namely the data bus of the, on the system. So you, and why does that increase performance? Because you can have more bytes being transferred from memory to the CPU in a, at once. That requires space, space-time trade-off. More space for the wires, less time for the transmission. And what was the second way to increase performance? Putting a cache in between main memory and the CPU. Actually we put three different caches, three levels of caches. There was a level one, level two, and level three cache. And if you have a cache between, that goes in between main memory and the CPU, that cache, the, in terms of storage capacity, that ca the capacity of the cache is less than main memory, but what? Greater than the CPU in terms of storage capacity, but and, and in terms of speed, it's what? Faster than the main memory, but slower than the 
But, and the idea is that we prefetch. Now, so those are two. Now, the third primary way, now there's, there are dozens, hundreds of ways to increase performance, little tricks. But these three primary ways, the third primary way to increase the performance is called pipelining. Okay, well, we have an announcement to make. We lost due to technical difficulties beyond our control. We're going to have to re-record the rest of this lecture. So here we are sitting in an empty classroom with only my trusty camera operator, Josh, who's agreed graciously to refilm this part of the lecture. So now the whole concept of pipelining uh, can be illustrated by a very uh, neat example. The example is you have a cabinet maker who builds cabinets for his customers. And the cabinet making process involves three stages. The, in the first stage, what the cabinet maker has to do is cut the wood. You know, has a table saw, has tools to do that, by the way. And then um, after he cuts the wood, then he has to assemble the cabinets. So, so to assemble the cabinets, he needs a different set of tools. He's got power screwdriver and uh, maybe a nail gun, whatever. And so he assembles the cabinets. And then in the third stage, he paints the cabinets. So he needs paint brushes and paint and all that kind of stuff. And so this cabinet maker builds these cabinets and he first, you know, he, he, he has a list of customers and the customers give him the orders. And he, for the first cabinet, first he cuts the wood for the first cabinet, then he uh, assembles the first cabinet, and then he paints the first cabinet. And then he, for the next customer, he cuts the wood for the second cabinet, he assembles the second cabinet, he paints the second cabinet, and so on. And so the cabinet maker is able to produce these cabinets for his customers this way. So now, what happens if the, if the um, cabinet maker ha uh, has, gets more orders and he wants to speed up the process and crank out more cabinets per day? So what he does is he hires two workers. Now, how do you think these two workers, how do you think he, could, he should use these two workers to speed up the number of cabinets that he can produce per day? Well, one way to do it is to have them all cut the wood at the same time, but this time they're doing it with th three cabinets, and then all assemble the cabinets at the same time, and then all paint the cabinets at the same time, and at the end of the day, they would have three cabinets coming out in the same time that it would take to produce one because they have two extra workers. Now, what do you think about that arrangement? <laughs> it seems like there must be a better way. Well, how, how, could, how, how, how could it be better? What's, uh, what's, what's wrong? I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you know you're, you're increasing your throughput three times this way. So what's wrong with that? Why is there a better way? Okay. That is true. They have to change. Yes, yeah, so actually, that's a good point. There is some, there is some setup time and some teardown time. Um, so, uh, and they're always having to do the setup and, and tear down. So how can you alleviate that problem? Yeah, so you could specialize. What you're saying is specialization. Okay, so, so another way to do that is to have the first, uh, when the first cabinet needs to be constructed, the first worker could cut the wood for that, and then he could give that cut wood to the second worker who only does the assembly, and while the second worker is doing the assembly, the first worker can be cutting the wood for the second cabinet. And then in the next stage, the uh, assembly of the first cabinet can be given to the painter, and the cut wood for the second cabinet can be given to the assembler, and then we can start cutting on the third. And so that, obviously, what is that analogous to in a, in a factory setting? That's the famous what? Line. It's the assembly line, like Henry Ford cranked out those Model Ts on the assembly line. But now, why, you know, but there's some delay. I mean, why not, you know, when it was first getting started, there's some delay. So, I mean, what makes this better? There, there is a, a basic reason why that is, there's another reason, not just like specialization and setup time and teardown time. There's another really important reason why that's better, why that is more economical. Can you think of it? Okay, so look, the key is the tools. The first way we were doing it, what did you have to have? You had to have... You had to have three separate... You had to have three... Saw, yeah, you had to have a whole set of tools, right. So it's way more economical to do it with the assembly line method because you're using the same tools. 
Okay, so in the hardware analogy, what happens is the parts of the CPU are the tools. You see what I mean? And so what pipelining is, is pipelining is this assembly line concept where you can use parts of the CPU to do this and then another part of the CPU to do this and another part of the CPU to do this and another part of the... And then, and, and it is that assembly line part. And so what happens is all the, this is hardware parallelism. This is yet another example of hardware parallelism. Okay, so that's the concept behind uh, pipelining. And what we're going to do now is we're going to explore pipelining in MIPS. So this next slide shows us uh, the signal propagation that has to take place each time an instruction is executed. And as you recall, we had uh, five different uh, stages. Um, we had the IF stage, the ID stage, the EX stage, the MEM stage, and the WB stage. Okay, so IF is instruction fetch, ID is the instruction decode, EX is the execution unit, MEM is the data cache, and WB was called write back. And if we look at this figure, uh, figure 12.40, we see that we have these, these stages are separated by these horizontal dashed lines. Okay, so the IF stage, the instruction fetch stage is up there at the top. And then we have the ID, the instruction decode slash uh, register file read is the ID stage. And then the EX is the execute stage and MEM is the uh, data cache. And then WB, the write back is, is where the data has to flow through the CMUX and then write, be written back to the um, register bank. Up until now, what, we've, what we said is everything happens in one clock cycle. And now, and think about what happens now, if visualize this. Visualize what happens the instant the program counter, the PC, the very top register, is changed at the end of a cycle, at the end of the previous cycle. So, boom, the program counter changes, right? Now, imagine, now, which ones of these units are sequential and which are combinational? Do you, the sequential ones are the ones that have to be clocked. Do you, can you, do you remember which ones have to be clocked? The program counter obviously has to be clocked. What else? The register bank has to be clocked. That's that load CK, the, da the data cache, right. uh, mem read and mem write. Okay, so imagine what happens the instant the program counter changes is clocked at the end of a cycle. What has to happen is all those combinational circuits, there is a gate delay. And what is the definition of a combinational circuit? Output depends only on the input, and it's only a matter of a few gate delays that the signal propagates. So in a few gate delays, the signal would propagate through the instruction cache, and then, and then after those gate delays, those signals will be presented to the decode box, and then that's a combinational circuit, and also the sign extend is a combinational circuit, so after a few gate delays, that will propagate down through and be presented to the AMUX and the ASL2 and the adder and the ALU. Those are all combinational circuits. After a few gate delays, that'll propagate down, and then they will be presented to the data cache, and the address and the data in will be presented, and then after a few gate delays, that will propagate through it through the CMUX, and then that will propagate down, through, and that has to propagate through the CMUX and be presented to the register bank. So you can just think of that as, as just flow, those signals are just flowing at you. And the period of the clock cycle has to be designed to be long enough so that as soon as you change the uh, output of the program counter when it's clocked, the designers have to take into account all that propagation delay before they can do the next clock. So how can we use this pipeline concept to speed this up? Well, obviously what's going to happen is, in our analogy, the first stage was cutting the wood. Well, here the analogy is instruction fetch happened for the first instruction. And then while the instruction decode is happening for the first instruction, we want to have the instruction fetch happen for the second instruction. But now how can we do that? There's a crucial modification that we have. Can you think what we need to do in order to get this thing set up that way? We're going to have to do what in between each one of those stages? Right now, the things are just flowing through. See, they're just, they're just cascading through. But we want this to happen and then this to happen. So what do we have to do at the boundary? Yeah, yeah well, well, what we have to do is we have to capture the, signal, the signals that are going from one stage 
capture them in what's called a boundary set of boundary registers. So that after we have um, fetched the first instruction, those signals are captured the out, at that boundary and so that we can be instruction fetching the next instruction and then those boundary registers can be the inputs to the next stage. Do you see the concept there? So we need a whole set of what are called boundary registers. And figure 12.43 shows us those boundary registers. So there is a set of IFID registers, so that's the instruction fetch slash instruction decode registers. And then there's a, and that's, in that, that's in the boundary between the IF and the ID stage. And then, and similarly for the other stages. So, so see what has to happen is those, those have to capture, those capture the, those, intermediate those intermediate results. So now let's compare before and after pipelining. So figure 12.42 shows the sequence of events without pipelining, so without those boundary registers. And so what happens is cycle one, the, in cycle one, that those signals flow through the IF, the ID, the EX, the MIM, and the WB. And then uh, instruction one has been executed. And then at the, at the beginning of the next cycle, instruction two is executed, and again, through, with, through the IF, ID, EX, MIM, and WB, and similarly for instruction three. So you've got one instruction after another after another. So that's without pipelining. So with pipelining, we have this assembly line analogy, and we overlap these stages. Because now, the propagation delay between each stage is like, ideally, one-fifth of what the propagation delay was for the whole thing, we can cut the cycle time down by what? A factor of five. You see what we're saying? By a factor of five. And so the idea then is we overlap with this assembly line analogy, we overlap the IF, ID, EX, MIM, and WB stages, and that allows a decrease in the cycle time. So we increase the megahertz rate, and we're not talking about like a few percent or 50 percent. We're talking about 500 or 600 percent. We're talking like multiples. I mean, this is huge. This is huge speed up because, uh, because we're taking advantage of the fact that we're, you know, we're capturing all those little propagation delays that are, that are the bottleneck for the whole thing. And so that provides parallelism in the CPU circuitry. So all those different parts of the CPU are executing concurrently now, are doing their computation concurrently. And, and this requires boundary registers to store the intermediate results between the stages. So figure 12.44 shows the timing with pipelining. This first one is pretty straightforward. Instruction one starts at time, at, at, at cycle one, we do the instruction fetch for instruction one. And in cycle two, the, we do the instruction fetch for instruction two. At the same time, we're doing the instruction decode for instruction one. Then at time three, we do the instruction fetch for instruction three, the instruction decode for the instruction two, and, and the instruction execution for um, instruction one, and so on. And you see that when you first start up the computer, of course, it takes a little time to get the pipeline filled, but once it gets filled, you are doing all these things, WB, MIM, EX, and ID, we're doing them all concurrently, okay? So that's with pipeline. And notice that what we, what, what the thing that this does is this, in, this increases the megahertz rating by, by a factor of five. I mean, it's huge, you know, it's, it's, and once you get the pipeline going, these instructions, can, you're cranking out five times more per second. Now, so the good news is <laughs> that we have a really huge speed up in the cycle time and a really huge speed up in how many cycle in how many instructions per second that that, that we can uh, process. The bad news is that this brings up a whole host of complications, and it might seem that these complications are really hairy to deal with, and they are. But the speed up with pipelining is so great that it's worth it. And in fact, every processor, every CPU uh, uses all these techniques, you know, wide data buses, caches, and pipelining. All CPUs uh, use these speed up techniques. And so what happens is when you have a pipeline system, there are what are called hazards. And there are two kinds of hazards. There are control hazards and there are data hazards. 
a hazard comes about if one instruction needs the results of the previous instruction, the problem is the, pre the previous instruction will not finish executing, not might not have the results necessary for the instruction that follows it. Most of the time, the, the next instruction to execute is the one that is physically after the previous instruction. So most of the time, instructions are executed sequentially. But occasionally you have things like if statements and loops, in which case the instruction that executes next is not the one that's physically located after the current instruction. And furthermore, you might not know where that branch is going to be until that instruction is finished executing. So that gives rise to a control hazard. And a data hazard is where like you're doing a computation and you have to take um, you change the value of one variable and then the next variable needs the value of that variable to do the next computation. So that gives rise to what's called a data hazard. And any time one of these hazards happens, what, has to, what the circuitry has to be able to handle is it has to be able to stall the execution of the following instruction until it gets the result of the previous instruction. And that gives rise to what's called a bubble in the pipeline. Okay, and what, basically what it does is it slows down, it decreases the performance over what it would be without the bubble. So the net effect is, first you have to design the circuitry to handle that, and the net effect is that it slows it down. But of course, if, if we're lucky, that's just a temporary slowdown. Overall, the benefits of pipelining are so great that even with these occasional slowdowns, the net result is still worth it. Okay, so figure 12.45 shows graphically what a bubble is in the pipeline. Now, this is, here's where it gets a little tricky. In part A, with no hazards, you see the leftmost instruction on the top line is the first instruction. The instruction below that shifted a little bit to the right is the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one, then the fifth one. And now here's the thing. We don't want to have, we don't have room in the page to, you know, keep going down. So, so what happens is, the second instruction on the top line is actually the sixth instruction. And then the next one is the seventh, and then the eighth, and the ninth, and then the tenth one is the second instruction on the bottom line. And you, we can see that without, with no hazards, with no bubbles, once we get up to, to um, cycle five, we're doing one, two, three, we're doing all those five things are, con are happening concurrently, and we've speeded up the computation by five times five times more instructions per second are processed. Now, if we look at part B, part B shows what happens if we have a branch hazard. Now, look, let's trace through part B. You see, in the first instruction on the top line, that is instruction one, then the second one below it shifted is instruction two, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. And now what this figure shows is that Instruction 7, which is the second instruction on the second line, that we're, we are assuming that that is like a branch instruction. All right? And because that's a branch instruction, we will not know the target address of where to do the branch until after that instruction has finished executing. That means, whereas instruction 8 would have executed at that slot, at that, on that empty slot just below instruction 7, now no inst we have to stall. So we stall, 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 stall. And now you see at, on the third line, you see that instruction 7 has been completely executed and that's when instruction 8 can start. And so all those blank spaces are spaces where the circuitry is not being used to compute anything. But, and the engineers have to design the Hardware engineers have to design the ability to stall and to know that those, you know, and to keep track of what instructions are where. It has to schedule all those. And now, here's an interesting, another little interesting phenomenon. You see with this five-stage pipeline, what's the delay? It's actually four, right? You see the width of those white gaps? Oh, yeah. The width of those white is actually four. So, even, so it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, with a five-stage pipeline, when you, have a, when you have a bubble, the bubble is, gives you a gap of four. So what, we're, what we've illustrated here is the, worst, is, is the worst case scenario with a hazard when 
the next instruction depends on the computation of the previous instruction. But this is, the, this is a worst case delay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to explore a myriad numbers of ways to alleviate this worst case delay because, because that, you know, this bubble decreases. This is the worst case scenario for a delay. So, oh, by the way, uh, figure 12.46 is uh, some data that, that is uh, it's kind of rough, but it's, it's, it's pretty accurate. Um, in a typical MIPS instruction, it shows the instruction frequency. So arithmetic operations happen about 50% of the time. Load store happens about 35% of the time. Branches happen about 15% of the time. So those branches, those branch instructions are not that frequent. It's true that load store takes many cycles, but that's without cache. So you know, now that we're talking about the level, if you have like a 90, 95% hit rate on your, with your caches, then the load stores can take place in, in one cycle too. And then, and then but we, we, we already investigated how cache works. So all of this stuff uh, assumes that all this pipelining assumes that we have level one cache right there in the data flow. What are some of the speed up techniques that we can use in order to, to, in order to increase performance? So let's go back to figure 12.43 and see how that works. You see a branch instruction does not change the register bank. So consequently the write back stage is not necessary. And so uh, what you can do is in, with those instructions you can actually have some circuitry that says, okay, we can just skip the write back stage. And then that decreases your delay from four slots to just three. Another way to um, increase the performance is to consider what happens with a conditional branch. Because with a conditional branch, what the uh, MIPS processor does is it compares two uh, registers and depending on whether one's greater than or less than or equal to, depending on the conditional branch, Either the branch is taken or it's not. And if it's not, then the instructions after that are going to be executed anyway, right? So what you could do, and what, what, what you could do is you could say, okay, let's just assume that the branch is not taken, all right? And so, because sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't be. So if, it's, if the branch is not taken, you just assume that it won't be taken and you just keep doing the, you keep filling the pipeline with the instruction next and the one after that and the one after that. Then finally, when you find out that the branch, in fact, was not taken, then you're ahead of the game. See? So you haven't lost any time. There is, there is no bubble. Of course, the problem is, what if the branch is taken? Then you have to have the circuitry to clean up your mess. In other words, you have to be able to execute those instructions but then with the ability to roll back and to like undo them if in fact the branch was taken, okay? But if you predict right, that there, there, then there are no uh, wasted cycles. Okay. Basically what happens is if you could predict the future, then you could optimize your performance. You could know if you knew ahead of time. Well, let's think. So the more accurate we can be in predicting the future, the better our performance. So it would make sense, like suppose you're betting horses on the racetrack, you know, and, you're, and a horse wins one race. And then suppose the horse is, is, is um, going to race, you know, be in another race. Well, he won the first time. Wouldn't it be, make sense? Wouldn't your probability be high that he's going to win the second time? So, so similarly, what, one way to, to have a more accurate prediction of the future is to say, is to, is to reason that, like, if, the branch for this instruction was taken one time, then maybe the next time it will also be taken. Furthermore, if it was not taken this time, then it probably will not be taken the next time. So what you could do is you could use one bit to store whether the branch was taken previously and then predict that the branch will be taken this time if it was taken the previous time. So that's called dynamic branch prediction because you actually track what was happening historically in the execution sequence for that instruction. And figure 12.47 shows how, how the branch prediction works and it's a finite state machine. And we would store, you'd store one bit, that would just be like a D flip flop, right? And um, there are two states, and it, state zero and state one. In state zero, what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to predict that, that the branch was not taken, and in state one, we're going to predict that the branch was taken, that the, that the branch is taken. 
and then if we are in the state that says the branch was not taken, and then if that instruction executes and the branch is not taken, we stay in that state. And then we keep predicting the same thing over and over. But then if all of a sudden the next time the ins that instruction executes, that branch is taken, then what we do is the next time we predict that it's going to be taken. And so we stay in that state if it's taken, but then if it's not taken, that takes us back to the previous state. So that's one bit dynamic branch prediction. Question? Uh, does this it's, it's for that instruction. And so, and so the, the hardware actually has to have, have a, a bit for each, for, each inst for each instruction, but historically. So that can improve performance. But now there is kind of like a, um, a situation that you can have in a nested loop pattern. So here, here's an example of, of a nested loop pattern. So imagine that you have one loop here and then you have a nested loop here. And the condition, the instruction that we're talking about is the, is the branch for the inner loop. The inner loop will, will branch, the first time the inner loop branches, it, it'll branch, 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 branch. So yes, 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 it's taken. But then it breaks out of that loop, it goes to the outer loop, and then it enters the inner, and then it enters the inner loop again. And then it, yes, 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 and then no, and then yes, 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 no. So if the branches that are taken are yes, 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 no, 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 okay. Now, the very first time we start, we predict it's not taken. So we were incorrect, and we have a penalty, a bubble penalty to pay. But the, but the next time, we're going to predict that it was taken, right? And it is taken, so there's no penalty. Yes, 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 until we get to the end of the loop, at which point, we are predicting that it's going to be taken, but it's not, so there's a penalty. And then the next time we're going to predict what? Because it was not taken, we're going to predict that it's not taken, but this time it is taken, so that's another penalty right after that one, so that's two penalties in a row. But then we are good for the next few, okay? But you see here what's happening is we have these two penalties in a row. So now here's the analogy with the racehorse, okay? Suppose you go to the races and you see that this horse has won four times in a row. You say, oh, I'm going to bet on this horse. So you start betting on this horse. The horse wins four times in a row and you collect your winnings. And then the horse loses one race. Question is, wow, that was just one out of four. Would you still not, you know, bet on him even if he, he, even if he just lost one? Maybe you should bet on him again. Do you see what I mean? In other words, maybe what we should do is only predict it differently if it's different two times in a row. That concept is the basis of what's called two-bit dynamic branch prediction. So if you have a run of branches taken and you encounter one branch not taken, don't change your prediction right away. To change your prediction, you have to get two consecutive identical branch types, and then you change. So here, in figure 12.48, is the two-bit dynamic branch prediction. And so now there's four states. With two bits, there's four states. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. The upper left and the lower right are, when, are, are the situations where we've had a sequence of two or more of the same. So in the upper left, that's the state we are in when we have had two takens in a row, and at the lower right is when we've had two not takens in a row. So suppose that we are, um, so we start in the, in the lower left that, where we predict that it's not taken, and if it is taken, we go to the upper left where we, where, where we predict that it's taken. So now suppose that we're in the upper left and we, are, and we are predicting that it's being taken. So it's taken, we stay, taken, we stay, taken, and then suppose, ooh, it's not taken. So that takes us to the upper right state, but we are still going to predict that it's taken. See, because we've only had one to the contrary. So if it is taken, oh, that moves us back to our upper left. But if it's not taken, that's two not takens in a row, and that gets us to the bottom right. And similarly, the only way you can get to, from the bottom right to the top left is to have two takens in a row. See, to get you to start predicting taken. And in fact, if you work this through um, that previous example, you'll see that, you'll, that it alleviates those, that improves the, the performance.
And since nested loops are common, this is, this is a common technique. Okay, now what are some other ways we can increase performance? Well, this is expensive, but what you could do is you could actually duplicate your pipelines and have one pipeline be executing, assuming that the branch is taken, and have another one assuming that it's not, and then whichever one it is, when you, once you find out whether it's taken or not, you just throw away the one that was not, did, did not occur, and you keep this one. That's expensive, but it can be done. Those are control hazards. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about data hazards. A data hazard occurs when one instruction needs the result of a previous instruction, and it must stall until it gets the result. And this is called a read after write. So that's R-A-W, a raw hazard. Figure 12.49 shows a read after write hazard. In part A, we are assuming that there is no data dependency. So instruction two can be executed um, at its normal time after instruction one, where its instruction fetch is happening when instruction one is being decoded. Part B of the figure shows the bubble that occurs when there is a data dependency. So let's take a look at these MIPS instructions. Uh, the first instruction is add dollar $s2, dollar $s2, dollar $s3. So what does that do? That adds register 2 and 3 and puts the result in register 2. So register 2 is the destination register. But then the next instruction uses, takes registers 4 plus 2, register 2, and puts that in register 4. So it needs the computation from, from S2. So you see that dependency there? Instead of being four, actually instead of being a delay of four, this is only a delay of three because, because the, right, the instruction decode needs the write back. The instruction decode of the second instruction just needs the results of the write back of the first instruction. So that's an example of a raw, a read after write hazard. When you have this uh, read after write situation, um, you, what, the problem is you have the, these bubbles. So one way to uh, increase the performance in that situation is to find some instructions that need to be executed anyway that even though they might occur later or before that hazard, they could be executed without affecting the results. And so a good optimizing compiler can detect these data dependencies and, and instead of executing the instructions in the order that they would normally be executed in, actually take them out of order. And, you know, sometimes, you, that, sometimes instructions, you can find instructions that, where you can do that, sometimes not. But if you can find them, then you can, and that's called instruction reordering. And what it does is it fills the bubble in the pipeline with instructions that have to be executed anyway, and if their execution out of order does not affect the final results, then you can reschedule them and put them out of order. And each instruction that can be executed out of order decreases the bu bubble penalty by one, by one cycle. Now, what this phenomenon illustrates is abstraction versus performance. Now think about it. What is abstraction? Uh, it's the hiding of detail. And why do we like to hide detail? Because it makes the computation at one level be simpler than at a lower level, right? So it's hiding detail. Now, what, in order for the compiler to do this optimization, what has to happen? We, ha we have to give up abstraction. Because in an ideal world, it's easier for the compiler writer to not have to know the details of the pipelining and know how to reorder the assembly language statements. Do you see? So, but the thing of it is, is that abstraction always comes at a cost of performance. I mean, to write the fastest, I don't know, word processor, you would write it in, you, could, you should write it in assembly language, you know. But, and it would be fast, but it, it would be very difficult to maintain the software, right? So we, so we have the abstraction of a high order language and we have this, the abstraction of an operating system that provides services in between. But what we're doing here now is that we realize that abstraction comes at a cost of performance. So some, in some rare cases, and this is one of those rare cases, we actually give up abstraction and tell the compiler writer, you have to know the details of how pipelining works in order to be able to efficiently schedule these instructions out of order. 
So it's an interesting trade-off. Even abstraction has a trade-off, as good as it is. It has a trade-off in performance, and we give that up in this case in order to get extra performance. For the read-after-write um, hazard, there is another technique that's possible to speed up the, the, to increase the performance by using a technique called data forwarding. Now, here's what happens with data forwarding. Do you remember when we went from the one byte data bus to the two byte data bus? One of the things we did is we had a little shortcut path that went from the two MDR registers up to the MAR registers instead of having, and if we didn't have that shortcut path, the, the, way, the way to get the data from the data registers to the address reg registers would be to go all the way down and up to the register bank and into the address register, so we had that little shortcut path. Well, this is another example of a little shortcut path. So let's go to figure 12.43 and see how, where our shortcut path would work. Do you see Normally what would happen is when we had that example with what register was it? The S2 register, I think it was, that needed to be used in the next instruction. Mm -hmm. that, that computation would come out of the, from the ALU, it would circle around here and go through this, through the CMUX and then go back up into the register bank. And then the instruction that used it, that needed that, needed to have that instruction in the register bank in order, to, in order to, to use it. But look, that information is going to be present in the EX mem registers after the ALU. If you have a little shortcut path from, that, from those registers up to the IDEX registers, then while it, is being, while it is being routed in the next few cycles up into the register bank, it can be made available for the next instruction right off the bat. Do you see? By having a little, a little shortcut circuitry there, if you know there's a data dependency and it is going to be clocked into that register, but oh, but we can just make it available from that register with that little shortcut path. So that's called uh, data forwarding. And you, what you do is you construct a data path from the EXMIM ALU register to a, special, to a special IDEX register right off the bat so that the next instruction can use it. And what that does is that reduces the bubble penalty in figure 12.49b from three cycles to, ju to just one. Yeah. So the question is, how does that interplay with instruction reordering? See, um, it can be, the, bo both of these are, com both techniques are common, instruction reordering and these uh, data forwarding. The thing of it is, is that um, if you can fill the pipeline with instruction reordering, then it doesn't matter. You don't need the data forwarding. So the, so the data forwarding would, would be something where, that, you could, that you would use if you couldn't fill the pipeline. But, but, but they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And the last speed up technique that we're going to talk about is this concept of superscalar machines. This is based, superscalar machines are based on the fact that two instructions with no data dependencies can execute in parallel. And there are two approaches to superscalar machines. You could have one instruction fetch unit that can, that can fetch two instructions simultaneously and then have actually <coughs> a separate pipeline for each. And another approach is to have multiple uh, multiple execution units and out of order execution are inherent in both approaches. Now to show how this works, figure 12.50 shows how this, how this works. So in part A is the concept of dual pipelines. This instruction fetch unit in part A can fetch, you have to imagine that it has the circuitry to fetch two, the next two instructions simultaneously and get them started in, the, in these dual pipelines. These, and so the dual pipeline, so there's a two ID units, there's two EX units, there's two MIM units, and there's two WB units. Now, of course, the thing of it is, is that this inherently out of order execution where there's no data dependencies. Now, this next one is, in part B, is, the, is what happens with multiple execution units. Now, with multiple execution units, the idea is that the instruction execution is usually the bottleneck. And this is especially true with floating point processing. That is typically the, the bottleneck, the, the, the longest uh, delay. So with multiple execution units, what you do is instead of duplicating the whole pipeline, you just duplicate that part that takes the longest. 
And here we have, just as an example, some generic ALU unit, another ALU unit, and FP is a, like a floating point unit. All right? And let's assume, for the sake of argument, for the, of illustration, that each one of those, the, the propagation delay to do each one of those is like three times what the normal propagation delay for the other stages is. All right? So now you have to imagine that this is, this, when you imagine the execution with multiple execution units, the executions are staggered. So here's what would happen taking it from the top. The first instruction would be fetched. In the next in cycle, the first instruction would be in decoded, and the second instruction would be fetched. In the third cycle, the first instruction could be routed to the top ALU, the second instruction would be decoded, and the third instruction would be fetched. In the next cycle, the Second instruction could be routed to the ALU. The, now I lost track of my numbers. The third one could move to the ID and the fourth one would be fetched. And then the next time, the third one would be moved to the floating point unit. Do you see what I mean? Then what would happen is, on the next cycle, the top ALU would be fed to the MIM and, and so on, you see? And so this would work if each one of those middle units had three times the delay so that they so that after the third cycle the results of one of them would be able to be fed back into MIM. This, this is the multiple execution model of a superscalar machine. And now this next one seems a little seems a little um, odd because it doesn't seem like it should be possible. It's, this is called we had a we had a read after write. What about a write after read? If all instructions are executed in order, like suppose you have an instruction here that reads a register, and then you have another instruction that has to write that register. Well, think about it. If this one reads from a register, and this one writes to that register, the fact that this is a read, there is no data dependency. So how can you have a write after read hazard? Well, the only way you could have it is if you do what? is if you reorder the instructions, you see. So in a, it's, it's only a potential problem if you have out of order execution, you see. And that's called a write after read hazard. By increasing the frequency, not only does it improve the performance, but it also gives the marketers a way to market their chips. Because you, anytime you go to the store and you want, you know, you go to the online store and you order a computer, what is it, was one of the things that they advertise? the megahertz rating, okay? So of two, two different machines with two different megahertz ratings, you know, it, it, all other things being equal, the one with a higher megahertz rating is the one with a faster performance. But that's only true if you compare identical machines. If you compare two different machines with different megahertz ratings, one might be, the one with a higher megahertz rating might not be the one with a better performance because it not only depends on how many cycles per second, but how much work is done per cycle. And so it, this, this myth used to actually be more relevant in the old days when most machines only had one CPU and the megahertz rating of that one CPU is, is what mattered. But nowadays, um, most machines are multi-core. I mean, even mobile devices, your phone is multi-core machine. So, um, so, the, so it, it doesn't just depend on the megahertz rating anymore. In fact, what happened is historically, the engineers, the, 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 rating, the megahertz rating kind of plateaued out. And it's very difficult, it was very difficult for them to, to improve the, to increase the rating. So now we're at the end of chapter 12. And let's review what we've done through ever since chapter one. We've made several simplifications. You should be aware of these. Um, we mentioned the fact that to solve the feedback loop problem, there are two techniques, edge triggered flip-flops and master slave flip-flops. And uh, you should probably be aware that edge triggered flip-flops are actually probably more common in the implementation than master slave. Um, also, you remember when we talked about the system bus, we had these bus protocols for reading and writing and we had like three cycles and, well, that delay was, un was, was unrealistically short. And also, the protocols are much more complicated. There are there's setup time, and the time between the rising edge of this one and the falling edge of this has to be at least this many seconds. And, 
and the bus protocols are, are in practice are much more complex. And also the input output si subsystems are more complex. And there is another phenomenon that we didn't go into much detail. Uh, th that's this technique called direct memory access. Uh, DMA is uh, direct memory access and what, uh, what happens typically on, or on the system bus in a computer system is the peripherals and the CPU use the same bus and rather than have the CPU control the data transfer between disk and memory, instead of wasting cycles doing that, it gives that task to what is called the, a DMA controller, which is, a, which is its own tiny specialized CPU for controlling data flow over the bus. That way data can flow on the bus between disk and memory in parallel with the CPU doing its own task. It requires an arbitration protocol when two devices want to use the bus at the same time. So there's, but this direct memory access is one of the, is, is a major simplification that we have omitted. One thing that we've probably learned throughout this whole experience is the importance of finite state machines. Finite state machines are, the base, are really the basis of all computing. The Turing machine, if you've, if you've taken the automata theory class, a Turing machine is simply a finite state machine with an infinite tape. Finite, we saw that finite state machines are the basis of lexical analysis. Uh, when we did our uh, translation in chapter seven, our assembler translation in chapter seven. And really a computer is one big what? It's one big finite state machine with, you know, every flip-flop stores a one or a zero. And so that's the state. So you take all the states in all the CPU and it's one big humongous finite state machine. That's what it is. It has a state at any particular point in time. Each one of those flip-flops is either a zero or a one. And when a clock pulse happens, boom, whoosh, it goes to the next state. That's all it is. That's all a computer is. It's one big finite state machine with its state stored in the flip-flops of its circuitry. So we end with this note. Simplicity is the key to harnessing complexity. If you look at each one of those seven levels of abstraction, each one has its own little rules, its own language, and its own mathematical way of doing a computation at each level of abstraction. A computer system simply consists of, of building a system with each one of those levels of abstraction being precisely defined and having a translation process to go from one level to the next. And so now we can see one flip-flop making a transition, you know, like a JK flip-flop doing a toggle. We can see how that is related to entering text in a word processor at level seven, at, at level app seven. So that's it. It's been great. See you next time. Or <laughs> it's been great. Maybe I won't see you next time. <laughs>